Good day, Khan. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Uh, my, my privilege and honor, Guy. As always, it's nice to be with you and to do uh, anything that you would like me to do. <laughs> well, I'm going to remember that. Let me jot down a note on that. Uh, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and give us a little bit about your background? And then let's then talk about where did you grow up? Okay. Conrad Gottfriedson. I'm a founding partner at Apply Synergies. Uh, Bob Mosher and I work together to move forward the, the five moments of need framework and the methodology around it to, you know, to make a difference in organizations as it relates to workflow learning and how they go about learning. So where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in a little town of 700 people in Southern Utah called Circleville. Uh, the only claim to fame really that they have is uh, that's a hometown of Butch Cassidy, <laughs> who, uh, who was really the first consultant to leave our town. And I was the second, I think. I was pretty much the second. He had a different um, formula for his consulting practice. He removed vast sums of money and left organizations worse off than he found them. But <laughs> I, I try to do it a little differently. I was wondering where you were going to go with that, but uh, I'll, I'll let that lie. Um, so, so then where did you go off to school and, and what did you study? Tell us a little bit about your educational background. Well, I left our, our, our dairy set up, our cows and, uh, uh, and that little town of Circleville and uh, uh, left and, and went to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And uh, that's where I, I, I got, finished my undergraduate work. And while I was working on my undergraduate, I met a, a man by the name of Grant Von Harrison, who was head of the Department of Instructional Science then, became Instructional Psychology and Technology, and he hired me to be an ERT, an undergraduate research trainee. <laughs> and so I was exposed to this remarkable research and, and approach to instructional design and learning theory and you know, Dave Merrill was a part of the, 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 the staff then, and, and I was enamored by it. And uh, so I ended up uh, entering the, the master's program and immediately uh, transitioned into the PhD program there. And um, uh, the rest is history. Well, thank you. So, so where did you go once you got your PhD? Where did, what, uh, what, what jobs did you have? Let's talk a little bit about your job progression. <laughs> well, I knew uh, when I was moving through graduate school that I wanted to focus on uh, industry, learning in, in the real world of work. Uh, many of my, my fellow students were headed toward other universities uh, school systems, very uh, academic, but I knew I wanted to be in the real world of work. And that's uh, why I, I focused in on specializing on performance assessment and, um, and uh, measurement, uh, as well as research and instructional design. I did some postgraduate work at the University of San Francisco with Michael Scriven and others. And coming out of that, I ended up uh, being hired by Standard Oil of Ohio started uh, working in San Francisco, uh, eventually transferred to uh, Warrensville, Ohio, Cleveland area, where, uh, where I, I you know, headed up a, a, a help desk, a training group, and uh, a, a technical publications group. And that was in, in 1984, that's when I was uh, exposed to those three groups. And it became clear to me that there were five moments of learning need. Uh, that the moment of apply was what it was all about and the moment of change and solve and learn new and learn more because those three groups were attending to those issues, those challenges. And so in, in 1984, the framework of the five moments came into existence. And then I began uh, realizing that uh, the methodology that I'd learned in graduate school wasn't quite up to par in terms of addressing performance at the speed that you need to do that in the real world of work. My, my first week in, in, in the real world, my, uh, uh, the fellow I reported to asked me how it was going. I said, I'm just finishing the analysis work. And he goes, analysis? I, I didn't hire you to analyze. I hired you to do things. And so 
I began to consolidate analysis into design and and uh, collapsing uh, all the different practices that I learned. And so uh, looking at a, an agile, rapid instructional design process that would be true to the foundations of instructional design, but allow us to move faster and more intentional and in the way that work happens uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in organizations. Very transformational for me. Uh, at a certain point at Standard Oil, I decided that uh, I, I needed to leave them and actually start helping other organizations. And so uh, just uh, about five years after my work there at Standard Oil, I entered uh, a consulting. I started a consulting practice and, and uh, that has been where I've been ever since. Uh, holding the five moments, the methodology as I helped organizations uh, in their in their uh, need to ensure that people perform effectively on the job, no matter where they are. So, is your uh, consulting firm that you're uh, you run now is this the same organization, or is, was there a series of those? No, it, it, it's evolved. I, I just at, uh, in the initial stages, uh, a fellow graduate student who uh, had helped me through graduate school. He and I became good friends, and so we we started uh, uh, Guyman and Gottfriedson, and then uh, at a certain point uh, we we parted our our ways as good friends, uh, and then I it became the Gottfriedson Group until I could talk Bob Mosier <laughs> into joining me, and when I when I when that magic moment happened and he said he would, then what we did was we created Apply Synergies. What year was that? I mean, all of that experience and all of that. So uh, that consulting work and, and all of that into Apply Synergies. So when did you start this with Bob? That, well, <laughs> that was uh, about 10 years ago. Ah, okay. So, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So um, where do you live right now? Well, I live in Alpine, Utah, just uh, south of Salt Lake City. Uh, nestled up against some uh, beautiful mountains and uh, that allows me to get out and for many years I, I had uh, a couple of horses, uh, which is a passion of mine uh, riding I've been riding since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I could ride into the mountains and uh, uh, enjoy this beautiful world that that God has given us. Oh, excellent. That's very, that's very nice. So uh, let me shift gears here a little bit. Um, so in our prior discussions and exchanges, um, you, are, you are definitely performance oriented, lots of different language for that. But so uh, my language for that is human performance technology, HPT, of course, ASTD back in the day used to call it HPI, human performance improvement. Uh, in, in that world, it's been called performance improvement, performance technology, lots of different language for that. But what was your first exposure to that and that gave you your your initial performance orientation <laughs> well goodness i knew in graduate school that it was about performance and what troubled me was everywhere i looked it was focusing on knowledge but then when i hit the real world of work that's that's when i realized if at the moment of apply people can't do what they need to do then what good is it with everything else that I've done. So I, I could design the most remarkable learning solution. And I did have access to everything that you could want. I, I bought the, one of the first Apple leases. Of, I bought a Linotronic typesetting machine, I hooked them together and did desktop publishing before anyone, most people were doing desktop publishing. So I had access to remarkable resources, but it became clear to me that all of that had to end in people performing effectively in their flow of work on the job. So uh, that, you know, my graduate work was the, the program that I ended up uh, receiving my PhD is called Instructional Psychology and Technology. And uh, I was uh, working at their, the uh, out of graduate school at their corporate um, um, center for technology and and uh, so technology has been a part of that but it has always been 
you know, how does that technology enable performance and how do you do that? So, so who are some of your, so as a way to point our audience, especially the new people in the audience, or maybe some of the people who've been uh, in the business for a while, who are some of your most early influences? I'm, I'm looking for people and articles and books that, that had an impact on you that we can share with our audience. Well, obviously, Glory Geary, right? I mean, uh, uh, I, I was exposed to performance support before Gloria. I, you know, that was, uh, we were doing all of that. I, um, I, I had a, a workshop that I uh, offered through uh, that Elliot Macy, who was another remarkable influencer in my life, uh, helped begin to uh, offer that out publicly called Writing One Stop Documentation. That was a model of one, one, one man manual, one document that was a tutorial, a reference guide, and a student manual for classroom training. Single source publishing before there was single source publishing. And I ha had developed this model uh, uh, and, uh, and we've created a course around it. And uh, Elliot offered that. Uh, from that, um, uh, heading up that training division was, was David Holcomb, who, who, in, uh, who put me in the same hotel as Bob Mosier. That's how I became, uh, Bob was teaching a, a training workshop. I was teaching one-stop documentation and we were, were at the same hotels doing that. And we would swap classes at lunchtime for about 30 minutes. And I'd teach the five moments of need and Bob would teach my group ramp up and ramp down and what we were doing and we became dear friends. So th that little journey, uh, I was grounded in graduate school by uh, I, my mentor, Grant Von Harrison, who had a, a sense of business, but also was a true researcher and, and an instructional designer uh, beyond anyone that I've met since. And uh, he got me grounded uh, in, in things. And then uh, Gloria and Elliot and David Holcomb and Bob Mosier. And then ultimately I met remarkable people like Ruth Clark, her capacity to take uh, research and pragmatically bring it into the real world. There's been no one like Ruth. And uh, through Ruth, I met Frank Gwynn who is a dear friend and, and remarkable. And then through all of that, through the work that we do, I've had an opportunity to work with amazing people. Uh, Beth Daniel at Bank of America, where we put together, took our methodology and trained 150 ISDs and, uh, with Beth and, and uh, learned a lot. Uh, every time I, I've stepped into a project in the real world, I learn because that's what we learn in the workflow, right? As we do and as we meet challenges and so forth. So over all of these years, working with people, becoming good friends with those people uh, as we solve challenges of organizations, that's, that's been my journey. So, so, but are there particular books or things like that that you would recommend to people that are you know, starting the learning curve? Well, I would tell you that transformational, I would study, restudy, and study again uh, Gloria Geary's little book on electronic performance support systems. Uh, there, uh, <laughs> every time I go back to that book, I find an insight that's reinforcing something that I, I thought that I had discovered. You know, she was such a visionary and a remarkable mind and, and uh, capacity, certainly that. I'll, I'll tell you, one of the great little influencers um, in my uh, early career was uh, Mager. Uh, and uh, I loved his little book, Analyzing Performance Problems, or You Really Ought to Wanda. That was yeah. probably the first book outside of Gagne and Briggs. And, and uh, you know, I, obviously I was reading and studying the research because I was somewhat contemporary with those guys, a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, behind them. But, but, um, Maker, Maker's insight, pra practical insight was very helpful. Although I think that if he were around today, he would alter some of things based upon what is happening in the world of performance support. 
Yeah. I, on my very first day out of college in my first job in a training organization, I was given several things. And Bob Mager's book was uh, that book with Peter Pipe was, was one of them. And I took it home and I read it that evening. And the next day I ordered four copies and sent them to my best friends in college. This was in 1979. And they all wrote back saying the equivalent of what the heck? <laughs> Why are you sending me this? But well, I, you know, to ask the question, so is, is this a training problem or is this something outside of training? You know, yes. an important thing to do, right? Well, I thought so. We've, all these people were going to go into jobs after college. And I thought, this is something that you need to know. And we exchanged mail because it was 1979. So, you know, through the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, so I, we sent letters back and forth. I'm trying to explain why I bought you this book. <laughs> but I think that they were still yeah. into it. But you know, one other area that was really uh, impactful, when I was in graduate school, I stumbled across a body of research on structured authoring. And ah. I found, I found uh, Robert Horn uh, yeah. was, was doing a lot with structured authoring. And so I reached out to him and, and had an opportunity to get to know him. He started a little uh, 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 approach of structured authoring called information mapping, yeah. uh, as you recall. And, uh, and that, that whole structured authoring world of research and work. The other, the other body of research had to do with experiential learning. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was grounded in graduate work in behavioral uh, learning theory and cognitive learning theory. But I had to discover on my own the research behind, uh, you know, uh, experiential learning theory. And, and so that, that was where the, the gaping hole was in my graduate work. But that is also the research that had a profound impact that led me into workflow learning and all that, that um, I, I've been able to do since. Bob Horn is somebody that has had a major impact on me. I'm not sure that I ever adhered to his rules and all that. But I did one of these HPT videos with him, oh, I'm going to say three, four years ago. Uh, very interesting guy. He's working on uh, uh, very uh, critical issues. I forget the, the language that he used to describe that, but he's still at Stanford doing work. He maintains an office there, but uh, very influential to me and, and all the structured approach to writing and information mapping, yeah. the, the yeah. specifics of that. I still, I still have templates that I uh, update and they're all in that kind of a structured approach. Um, but uh, yeah, very influential. So, so thank you for mentioning that. So um, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is that you do, I normally set this up saying, if you were at a neighborhood party and there's new neighbors there and they don't know you and they said, Con, what do you do? How would you answer them? <laughs> well, I, I answer them and, uh, um, with this. I, I say, I, we help organizations figure out how to be more effective in how they train and support their people in the work that they do, how to, how to help them, how their people perform effectively on the job all the time, wherever they are in a changing world. And, and that's, that's at the, the bottom line of, of what we do. Although I'm not sure it's a, an effective elevator speech. To, to this day, my mother-in-law says, uh, so what is it that you do still? And <laughs> so that's the acid test for sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure I've got that elevator speech down as well as I need to, but enabling effective performance on the job, particularly uh, learning in the flow of work is where our, our focus is. Yes, well, thank you for providing that example. I want, I want our audience to understand that they need to have something like an elevator speech to explain themselves in some short and sweet kind of a statement. But, but I know, I know you're, you're the, what you've gone through because I have relatives who always ask me, how can you develop training for people on a job that you've never had? They <laughs> can't imagine it. And yeah. of course it's our secret sauce. Um, yeah. Knowing how to go about doing that, but but it is a challenge. And uh, but explaining ourselves on that thirty or sixty or ninety second elevator speech to 
executives in our company, they're like your neighbors. They don't necessarily understand what we do. If we're, if we're talking at our own conferences and talking in our jargon, that's one thing. But when we're trying to explain ourselves to potential clients, they don't get, they don't understand the lingo. So I really like that you, you are fairly jargon free in your example. <laughs> well, uh, you know, another question that I asked early on, this was, this was in my early days, 1984, uh, just figuring out how to work in the real world. I, I asked, I asked this question, what is the intent of what I do? You know, what, what is my intent? Uh, and that was a very, that was a transformational moment for me because I realized that my intent was to enable effective performance on the job. You know, it, it wasn't to develop great learning. Yeah. You know, instruction and learning is a means to an end. What end? To enable effective performance on the job, no matter where a person is, when they need it. And, and uh, that's, that's been the, the intent of everything that we do. Well, I'm silently cheering over here on my side of the Zoom uh, cameras um, because I think that that's so important. We're, you know, too many people are focused on activities, too many focus, are focused on the means, and they, they don't have a good understanding of the ends. They don't have an understanding of the terminal performance requirements back on the job yeah. for their audiences. And so, um, but anyway, that's, you know, but so here, here, I agree uh, totally with you. Uh, so let me shift gears here uh, a little bit again here. So as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what you're currently focused on? What new learning curves are you climbing um, as you, you know, continue that lifelong pursuit of learning? Well, right now we're heads down uh, focused on uh, learning in the workflow, workflow learning. But a unique, uh, you know, the, the, the unique aspect of workflow learning, that is learning as you do your work. A, a lot of folks interpret workflow learning as, as just learning when you're in the workflow. But to the degree that you have to stop your work to learn, you're moving toward more traditional learning. You know, because I, when I stop my work, then I still need to transfer it to my real world and then uh, figure out how to integrate that with my other skill set. But real workflow learning is I'm learning as I do my work. So I, there's no transfer. It's transferring right then. And that is what we've learned to do. Thanks to Gloria Geary. Thanks to a digital coach or an EPSS, whatever you want to call it, that, that methodology. It allows us to do that. I find in our industry that, that uh, we have a very narrow view of learning. We think learning means about bringing something into our minds and storing it in our minds. But when you focus on performance, it's much more than that. Every time I perform, I am learning uh, at the moment of apply, change, or solve. I'm learning. You know, every time I walk through the steps of something, I'm learning I, experientially. And that's what experiential learning is all about. So, you know, that's 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 the that's where our focus is that whole world of workflow learning and th specifically then how do you enable learning as people do their work Gloria, and so i i figured all of this out you know with bob and our team and then i step into gloria geary and find that she's talking about unintentional learning as well as intentional learning and i'm going unintentional oh that's learning in the workflow with performance support. She'd already thought it through. So that's that's the beauty of this brilliant uh, pioneer in, in the world of performance support, Gloria. So our, so my next question as part of this is that, you know, what are you learning, but then what are you writing about? So are you, can you share with us anything about uh, articles or books that you're working on or anything else that uh, communicates, you know, what you know, what you're learning to others? Sure. So we're, we're going to be publishing a, a digital book this year on workflow learning. Bob and I are. And um, that's that's a fundamental focus this year. Uh, I, 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 we've been trying, Bob and I have been trying to, to be able to uh, step away from changing a tire on a moving truck, you know, which is the nature of our work, uh, and uh, be able to uh, rework uh, and, and write 
a book on learning at the five moments of need, have it outlined, chipping away at it. Uh, but that that's down the road. Uh, the the focus this year is this workflow learning uh, digital book. So when will that be available? Uh, mid year, uh, 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 hopefully uh, June. Can you overview a little bit about what that's about and what what the reader will learn and walk away uh, from their exposure to this? Well, they're going they're they're going to learn about uh, everything around this. What does it mean to learn while working, and what does it take to enable that? You know, and what is what is the the theory and the thinking behind it, and what have we learned practically with other organizations as we've done it? Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let me shift gears here a bit again. Um, the, my next question has to do with the language and labels that we use. Um, and so my question is, there is, is there a favorite term or phrase that you would define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused as you see it uh, being uh, used and or it's being misconstrued by other people. But uh, so I, I, I'm looking for some term or phrase that that uh, you can provide your spin on its definition. What would you have for us? Well, I think one of the great challenges is uh, the the term uh, EPSS. You know, uh, we've we, we found that although we can sell the term EPSS to L and D, it's more difficult to sell that term out to the organization, out to the business. And so what we've sought for is a, a rebranding of that. We rebranded EPSS uh, and have done, you know, from electronic performance support to embedded performance support system. Uh, and and we, we still talk about that, but we found that if we call it a, a, what this EPSS, a digital coach, which is what it is, it's a digital coach. It, it's there at the moment of need on the job coaching me uh, uh, and, and what I do. And so, uh, you know, we've repositioned that and are repositioning that as a digital coach. Uh, I'm, I'm working with a client right now who sees all things as an EPSS and, and that is often the case. You know, if it's electronic and if it's performance support, it's an EPSS. Well, Gloria was very specific about what an EPSS is and it's not online help. According to Gloria, it's it's it has to be able to orchestrate all those resources and intentionally to drive effective performance on the job, and so that orchestration, that intentional orchestration, is very important. And so we call it a digital. We're calling it a digital coach. We we find that that works very well with the business, and uh, and and we're still trying to navigate L and D, which is really a tougher challenge in the in in the journey than than the business we all the, our benchmarking data tells us that the business embraces you know a performance uh, a support and what we're doing but but the those responsible for learning uh, <laughs> we find if we if we say that we're helping with performance support somehow hr feels like we're trampling on their turf in terms of performance improvement. Well, performance improvement is a part of what we do. We want to make sure that people are continuously improving in the workplace. You do that with a digital coach, but that's not to negate what HR is doing already, although alone, it'll never be enough What, what, what uh, uh, under that. So uh, another term, performance improvement. <laughs> how that is viewed uh, as a discipline and so forth. Real performance improvement happens in the flow of work. It's gap learning at in the most personal way where I, as a performer, as an employee, come up to a moment in need in which I need to perform and I don't know how to do that. Two clicks, 10 seconds, digital coach. I'm following the steps to do that. I can get to all the resources that I need to do that. And so I close that gap at the moment of need that I need to close that gap. And have I improved my performance? Absolutely, every time. So this suggests that your digital coach, which is a rebranding, 
is is a rebranding of I, I excuse me if I get this wrong, but is it your performance support pyramid? Is well, that- the performance support pyramid is the methodology that that enables us to intentionally orchestrate resources. So that pyramid is a, a, a methodology or an approach, a structured approach, by the way, from structured authoring, a very structured approach to uh, organize those assets across all the different digital coaches that we might create to support performance. That it, It's that structure that allowed the Hartford, for example, to take an entire division and move them from one area of work into another area of work with their, uh, their, their version of an EPSS, their knowledge management system, you know, uh, because they had that consistent structure. Can you uh, share with us uh, the, the pyramid and uh, what the layers are of the pyramid? The, the, the intent of the pyramid is that uh, you, you want to be able two clicks, 10 seconds, access contextually from your work uh, the, the support that you need at your moment of need. And that support is at the job task level. So two clicks, 10 seconds, I need to be able to get to the steps at a high level of what uh, that, that would guide me and help me do what I need to do. If I need more detail in that to solve or, or because I don't know how to do it, then I can click and get to the detailed steps. But maybe I'm lacking knowledge. The next layer is the supporting knowledge or maybe I need a reference resource like a decision tree or, uh, or a job aid or a, a policy. Those are reference resources. Below that are learning resources. So maybe I need to pause briefly and take a micro learning uh, piece. That's in the learning resources. And then the people resources, last of all, as Gloria Geary put it, with a minimum of support from other people. But there are times where you need that support, particularly at the moment of solve that that's at the bottom layer. And as you move down that pyramid, you're stepping further and further away really from uh, l- learning and working in the workflow. But it's, 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 it's orchestrating all of those resources that organizations already have according to that structure. How did I do? Did that? Uh, no, sense? that was perfect. Thank you. I was looking for that because you know, I, I think it's, it's critical that people understand that, that, that sometimes people need to go deeper, um, and, but sometimes yeah. they just need a hint. Uh, so there's, so you're organizing um, all the references and resources, including people, um, so that you can help people perform back on the job. Yeah, and you know, Guy, uh, so what's critical here is that we support performance at the job task level. And we take all the scattered resources and we orchestrate them at the job task level uh, according to that pyramid so that for any job task that I need to do, I can get to the resources. And by the way, there isn't a, a job that, that any individual has that doesn't have tasks, including if you're a leader in an organization. Uh, Bob and I just did a, a podcast on, on uh, uh, performance support for leaders and how that works and how that looks. And uh, uh, he, by the way, uh, we, we, we didn't turn the recording on properly, so we're redoing that. But it was a really good podcast that we recorded. But we're, we're finishing that up uh, this, this, this week again. Uh, and, um, but, but performance happens everywhere. You've just got to be able to determine is that principle-based performance or procedural-based performance, but you can document it and you can find the resources for it. Here, here. Thank you so much for that. All right, let me uh, shift gears again, and we're going to kind of revisit what we talked about a little bit earlier, but what I'm looking for here is uh, perhaps some uh, deeper stories uh, about the people who influenced you. So this is a chance for you to do shout outs to people from the past and Maybe there are names that are well known across the business, or maybe they're not, and maybe they should be. But uh, so uh, all of us need to understand that we rely on others to help us with our career development, with our professional development. And so um, do you have some stories for us about some of the people from uh, your past and present, perhaps, that uh, you can share with us? Yeah, so... How, how do I answer that question without mentioning Bob Mosier first and foremost? 
uh, is a dear friend and colleague, but we have been um, working long before we formed Apply Synergies. You know, when when Bob and I were were together, we started to share. Bob has this great gift. Uh, I uh, he can take and and help me unravel something that I'm thinking about and 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 bring it to to a point to where the rest of the world can understand it. I remember when we were teaching a workshop. Bob and I were te teaching a workshop in the the Netherlands, and I I I could see that they that the people there couldn't understand. They couldn't see beyond the training. So I had this idea about train, transfer, and sustain and, and all of that. So I just grabbed the flip chart and I started writing. Bob looked over and he's talking. He goes, what are you doing? I said, just stay tuned, keep talking. And so I, I, I did this little uh, uh, graphic that shows train, transfer, sustain. I turned it around, shared it with a group and blank stares everywhere. And Bob, Bob looks at it and goes, let me explain what Khan was just saying to you. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, uh, Bob challenges uh, uh, my thinking and, and together he brings a rich insight and, and together we are, we've been able to take uh, and, and figure things out. So that, that's the first shout out. The second shout out is all of the people with whom we've had an opportunity to work with every project. This is true workflow learning, right? You go into a project, we have our methodology, we have all of that, but then they throw a curve at us that we've never met before. And so we have to figure it out. And so it's, it's in that figuring it out where the real ahas of of uh, our, our, our journey happened. And so figuring that out has always ended up improving upon and validating what it is that we're doing. And so I mentioned earlier, Beth Daniel. Beth, Beth would, when we were working with her at Bank of America and we were training their, their uh, instructional designers and uh, working through all of that, Beth, as I would share the methodology with her, would push me back until it made sense to her. And as she pushed back and it made sense to her, then it made better sense to me because she was challenging my thinking. Sue Reber in our organization and, uh, and Carol Stroud have also been, uh, you know, we, we've brought them onto our team because they push back. They say, well, that doesn't make sense. And, and so it's, it's anyone who, listens and says, oh, what about this or this? Or oh, I'm not sure that makes sense. That's how we get better. So every project that we do, we learn more. And you had mentioned a couple of people from the, from the past, from the university days. Yeah, Grant Harrison, I, I mentioned. Grant was uh, my, my mentor through graduate school, but uh, he, he exposed me. He was focused on literacy on uh, reading and English as a second language. And so that's where I learned and honed my skills as an instructional designer. But, but he was brilliant and, um, and had this, uh, uh, if research was only of value to him, if it worked, <laughs> you know, if you could apply it and it really worked. And uh, the, I, I appreciated that. I, I had, uh, another professor who was into research for research sake. You know, it, it didn't matter if it didn't mean anything or if it didn't lead us to a better place, it was just research. And that, that didn't make sense to Grant. And so I'm always grateful for him. And uh, Ron Guyman, who was a fellow graduate student who was just finishing when I started, Ron uh, helped me immeasurably, became a dear friend. Uh, and, and he and I, uh, really uh, honed together uh, what we call rapid workflow analysis and some of the other uh, practices uh, that, that have evolved uh, within our uh, per performance-based focused uh, instructional design practice. And then I mentioned Gloria Geary. Elliot Macy has been a dear friend, uh, very powerful in, in what he has done uh, and, and how he has influenced, and the doors that he's opened for me and for Bob. 
uh, be forever grateful. And in that association, we met David Holcomb, who is now with the eLearning Guild and founded all of that. David has been a, a dear friend as well and has has really helped and coached and and uh, uh, provided uh, help, particularly uh, you know as as Bob and I came together to begin with Apply Synergies. Both he and Elliot were profoundly impactful in all of that. And then I mentioned uh, Ruth Clark. And then at the heart of it all, Glory Geary. Frank Gwynn is a is has this remarkable ability to see the real world and live in the real world, and, and, but also to understand the theory behind it all. That's what he, he and Ruth worked together, uh, published a, a, a few books together, and uh, Frank is, is also a dear friend and, and colleague. Well, thank you for uh, mentioning these folks, and uh, many of them have uh, resources and such that our viewers can follow up with and uh, you know, help them in their pursuit of uh, uh, professional development. Yeah. Listen, I'd read anything that Ruth Clark has written. I'd get all of her books. I'd read them all because you're going to be grounded in the practical nature of, of, of instructional design theory. Yeah. Uh, and, and like no one else, like no one else. Maybe you can help me uh, corral her to do one of these videos with me because I've approached her in the past um, but uh, so I'll, we'll follow up with that here in a little yeah. bit. Well, and if, if Ruth can't, Frank can speak to everything. And Frank Frank is, is brilliant and also uh, knows how to walk. He's been living it uh, with some remarkable organizations. So again, thank you for all of that. So uh, to begin our wrap up here for the video, um, my my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially people who are new to the business um, and are looking to you know, develop themselves, develop their careers, et cetera? So what, what, what guidance would you have for, for them? Well, first, learn by doing. Uh, that is the heart of workflow learning, but but uh, I, I used to put next to my name, and every once in a while I'll do it. I, I put uh, Conrad Godfrey's PhD, and then R small W, and then large E. Uh, and uh, at some point, people will say, "What's an RW?" Well, that's real world experience. And please don't don't underestimate the power of that. But it needs to be uh, backed up by uh, uh, applied learning theory. Uh, and, uh, and so I would suggest that you need to look at not just behavioral learning theory, uh, cognitive learning theory, but also take a hard look at experiential learning theory. Uh, that's, that's, that's number one, learn by doing and back it up with, 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 with uh, theory, with, with proven, proven theory. Secondly, um, you, you gotta, you've got to be willing to challenge the status quo. Just, just because somebody says, well, research has proven, <laughs> doesn't mean that research has really proven it. And I found that my, my journey that I learned in graduate school was to challenge the status quo, to challenge theory. Theory has to be able to withstand the challenge. So, you know, I, I've watched the Ebbinghaus curve and, and his research that's been around forever, you know, since the 1800s, uh, be challenged. And, uh, and I watched the, I've watched the whole journey of that. And um, you've got to be willing to be open to the fact that things that we hold near and dear in the world of learning, like learning styles, <laughs> May, may not may not be able to withstand the the challenge you know where research on learning disposition rather than learning styles can withstand that challenge and so we've got to we've got to be willing to challenge and and learn how to challenge uh, uh, what what is seen as being uh, important and and real in our world of learning 
when in reality, it's not. Challenge a Mager objective, for example. I think Mager would, would be very different uh, and, and, and how he looked at learning objectives today in the world of workflow learning. And that's not to say there's not a place for them, but there's a different place for them. There's something that I've just said that might cause a few people to shake just a bit. Yes, well, thank you so much for doing this interview with me today. Um, I, I, I very much appreciate uh, you sharing your insights and thoughts and, and pointing our audience to some people and resources that they can follow up on. And uh, I, hopefully they'll be looking forward to these uh, two books that uh, are out on the horizon. Uh, and uh, we'll climb climb that learning curve uh, along with you. Yeah, so much. The workful learning book is a reality. The other is a, a dream, but working on it. Well, yeah, you you've made a start. You've outlined it at least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chipping away at it, as, as you said. Yeah. Con, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.